Quick! Uh, what are two of the most forgettable Pokémon? Uh, Basculin and the Diaper Deer. Well, not anymore. But why? And same with the two new Hisuian forms. What's the deal with these four Pokémon in Pokémon Legends Arceus? What are their potential inspirations and origins, and why are they so gosh dang amazing? Like, actually, these four Pokémon are some of the deepest. Well, let's find out. Background info you should know, and for more details on this, check out our last video on Pokemon Legends Arceus. Hisui is the name of the Sinnoh region before it was given the name Sinnoh, which reflects the real-world Hokkaido region of the same time period that this game seems to take place. What's important for now is that this is where in the real world one would find the Ainu people, those indigenous to Hokkaido, and their mythology is certainly playing a role in some of these new Pokemon. Heck, their patterns and architecture are shown also. Within Ainu tradition, there is a belief in entities called Kamui. While it cannot be compared directly to common Western spiritual beliefs, I'll try my best to sort of explain it in a simple way. They are very similar to how Kami are viewed in Japanese Shinto practice. General spirits. They can be anything from the beings who created the universe to local spirits that live within all animals, plants, and the environment. Some describe it as a form of animism vaguely similar to a number of Native American beliefs. The Shinto concept of Kami and the Ainu Kamui are often compared, but overall the traditions are still very distinct. Anyway, to sort of get what I mean, let's look at Hisuian Braviary. First off, regular Braviary was always a bald eagle, which has many eagle relatives, and this is perfect. Hokkaido is home to the Stellar's Sea Eagle, also known as the Owashi. And get a load of that beak! This is certainly the inspiration here, as they share the same habitat and color palette, and the white head of the Braviary we know already carries over. Though this is fun, Unovan Braviary's head resembles some Native American war bonnets, whereas Hisuian Braviary's head resembles a Haguma. This is Imperial Japanese Army officer headwear, particularly during the Boshin War, which happens to be around the same time period that this very game seems to take place. Plus, very fitting to keep its head war-themed. But also, also, the Pokémon website mentions that it flies here from further up north, which implies Russia, and its head also resembles their traditional Crossack hats, which were also used as army officer hats. Or perhaps Pokémon is implying the area where there was once a land bridge which early humans used to travel from Asia to North America. After all, bald eagles freaking love Alaska, and this would further link up this Braviary to the more American-inspired Braviary. Now, some Kamui are more revered than others and are given the honor of having the women wear secret girdles dedicated to them. They were used to indicate lines of matrilineal descent. The author of Ainu, Creed and Cult, notes eight different girdles, one of which is dedicated to the Sea Eagle Kamui, known as Kapachia Kamui. Now, as for the psychic typing, that is a strange one, and in our rush to get this video out state, we got nothing solid. It is still very early on, but it could simply be due to its connections with spiritual energy and such. Or it could be pulling from a major Kamui who was also a bird, though an owl, a Blankiston's fish owl, or Shima Fukuro. Being a fish owl does connect it somewhat more with a sea eagle. It's known as Chikap Kamui, or Kotankor Kamui. It watches over the land and makes sure rituals are performed correctly. And owls are often seen as wise, so psychic. That's incredibly loose, though. But it is also considered one of the rarest birds in the world, possibly explaining why we are only seeing this form of braviary now, in the past. They've gone basically extinct by the time of the more modern games. There's also the Screech Owl, and a Kamui associated with that is the Yukchikap Kamui, i.e. the Divine Deer Bird, which is said to always know the exact spot where deer are found for hunting, almost like a sixth sense. So perhaps this Braviary is pulling from various bird-related Kamui, or perhaps not. But what is super cool is that Kamui like this are often the ones prayed to for guidance and assistance. And considering that you can fly around with the help of this one and ride around on weird deer, that may be a part of the inspiration. Like the ride Pokemon in Sun and Moon, you call upon them for help. And speaking of weird ear, let's do that next. 
It's a new evolution of Stantler, who also gains the psychic typing. Notably now though, Stantler pretty much was already psychic type. It learns loads of psychic type moves, and it's already able to create a strange space where reality is distorted thanks to its antlers. Distorting space, how thematic of Sinnoh. Staring at its antlers creates an odd sensation as if one were being drawn into their centers. Those who stare at its antlers will gradually lose control of their senses and be unable to stand. These are all from Pokedex entries. It's based primarily on a Sika deer, though there are also reindeer and moose elements. But a Sika deer is definitely the most similar, what with the spots and the antlers and the being in Japan thing. And it mixes that with the deer in the headlights motif, and sort of the general themes of the Shishi Odoshi, literally deer scare. It is a Japanese device used to scare deer and birds away from gardens. Its name in Japanese is Odoshishi, after all. It's a very clever pun that encapsulates all of this, but it only works in Japanese, so we just got the name Stantler. Anyway, now it's a weird ear. Notably, psychic type can be explained as weird. Psychic terrain describes itself as things got weird in game after all. But also, that particular spelling of weird is Anglo-Saxon and can roughly be translated as fate or personal destiny things a future-seeing psychic type would be able to see. It also vaguely sounds like Ward, like how Shishi Adoshi ward off deer. The Pokemon website mentions that it uses its antlers like antennae, which would explain their new look, resembling various radio, TV, and satellite antenna. Now how about that Santa beard? Plop a deli bird on it and BAM! You got some Christmas merch for next year! Notably, Sika deer used to live from Vietnam all the way to Russia, where reindeer also live, but they've since become almost extinct outside of Japan. This might also explain why we haven't seen this evolution of Stantler before. They've become fully extinct by the time of the more modern games, global warming likely being a contributing factor. So what of the connection to Hokkaido then? Well, there's the Yezo Sika deer, also known as Yuk in the Ainu language. It is the largest of all Sika deer and sports the largest antlers out of all of them too. And it's found only on Hokkaido. So it's a fitting evolution. And it's also a very important source of food and clothing for the Ainu, similar to this Pokemon with the clothing. And as such, the Ainu show them great respect. The Ainu saw them and their respective Kamui as equals and always gave thanks. I mean, these deer are one of the sole food sources some of the villages have over winter. That's some mighty importance. So of course, there should be a Pokemon for it. Looking elsewhere, in the Shinto religion, deer, white ones especially, are considered the messengers of the gods, and are often rode around on by them. And if we look to the west, considering the weird part of its name, and considering that we were just in Galar, which is based on England, there is the White Heart of Legend, with its golden antlers. It became King Richard II's badge, and is to this day the fifth most popular thing to name a pub after. So there's that. Now then, Basque Legion. I love this thing. I've never loved a fish Pokemon this much before. It's so much cooler than Gyarados. Get out of here. Here's its official description. Basculin in the Hisui region can evolve into this Pokemon. This evolution occurs when a Basculin is possessed by the souls of other Basculin from its school that could not withstand the harsh journey upstream. Basque Legion fights together with these souls which attack opponents as if with a will of their own. So the first thing I think of with that description is, of course, salmon. And sure enough, salmon do exactly that in Hokkaido. In fact, Hokkaido is home to the Hokkaido Island Chum Salmon Fishery, which is the biggest volume chum fishery in the world. So of course, a salmon Pokemon in this region? Yes, please. Its long body shape also made me think about an Itauma cheap. That is after I looked up what that is. It's the type of boat that the Ainu most commonly used. And sure enough, the oars that would be used with them are shaped like Basque Legion's pectoral fins. It's the same thing we did with our Pacific Northwest salmon fake mon, Sanook. It's the Chinook in salmon. It's just such a good idea. Like the deer, salmon were incredibly important to the Ainu. And the Kamui of all fish, the divine fish, is a salmon that they would offer sake to. 
How masculine. Size can also be masculine, and wouldn't you know it, while most salmon I interact with get to be a little over a meter, the Japanese Huchin, or Sakhalin Taiman in Hokkaido, are huge for salmon! 20 pounds and over 2 meters! And it's got those pink ends, just like the massive Basculegion. How perfect! How have I not heard of these fish? Oh, because they too are near extinct. They have only 5% of the population that they should have. And this going extinct thing only really happened in the last 150 years or so, thanks to logging, oil, and poaching. Again, sort of explaining why we haven't seen this evolution before, but now that we're in a game that's set in the past, yeah, it's here now. How sad. Uh, anyway, the Legion in its name is referring to the group of souls that it carries with it. The souls of its fallen comrades who didn't survive the journey back upstream, which is a sad fate many salmon fall victim to. This is really cool though. It falls in line with the way the Ainu saw spiritual energy. Kamui can be anything from the beings who created the universe to the tools that people use so much that they absorb the energy of the person who used them, to the energy you get from eating food, especially animals. This energy is always being traded around. It flows especially to where it's needed, in this case upstream, as a Basculegion, who is only able to make it thanks to the added energy. It also falls in line with the idea of ancestor worship, a practice common across many cultures, but East Asia especially. Many believe that their ancestors follow their families to act as guardians to help guide and protect their offspring. Essentially, there are legions of spirits following you around. Now, other than salmon, I of course want to talk about bass too. After all, basculin and bass Basculegion. It's still got bass in the name, and the first one is clearly a bass. And so here's a fun thing. It's a bisu, the Japanese god of fishing and fortune. Most commonly, he's portrayed holding either a red sea bream or a sea bass, and many theorize that he may have in fact been Ainu, as he is especially hairy, a trait that Ainu have been historically described as having due to their comparative hairiness when compared to other Japanese people. Plus, in his origin story, he was essentially raised by them. He was stranded in the ocean as a baby and was saved by the Ainu people, who cared for him until he grew into the god of fishing. And really, it's not all that uncommon for neighboring peoples and neighboring mythologies to cross over and influence each other like that. On top of this, the name Ibisu is sort of interchangeable with Imishi and Ezo. When breaking down the meaning of the two kanji used to write the word, it can be translated as shrimp barbarians, which is notable as this was a term used by the Japanese for many centuries to refer to the northern peoples outside of the influence of the Japanese empire, such as the Ainu. And another thing throwing all of this sort of together, Basculegion's long body also resembles the koinobori, or carp wind socks that are used all over Japan, one particular day especially. Children's Day, a holiday celebrating children and their parents. The continuation of families for ancestors to watch over, essentially. And actually, it wasn't until the 1940s that it became known as Children's Day. Before that, it was Boys' Day, celebrating boys and recognizing fathers. How masculine like Basculin. This holiday also happens to be on the same day as their Dragon Boat Festival, which was adopted from China, whose celebration relates to the carp jumping over the Dragon Gate to become a dragon, you know, Magic Carp's whole thing. So yeah, Basculegion is Basculin's Gyarados, is it not? Plus, this festival features dragon boat races where whole legions of men row the long and narrow boats in honor of fish who avoid obstacles and swim upstream. And I mean, look at that thing! That screams supernatural aquatic thing, right? But back to the Ainu, and another similar fish. Interestingly, the Iwana, or White Spotted Char, which also lives throughout and around Hokkaido, does the same thing. I mean, it is, after all, in the salmon family. And Basculegion's longer, narrower body, as well as its plethora of spots, definitely seem to pull from this fish, especially since this fish was incredibly important to the Ainu, whose word for this is Amemasu. One Ainu tale speaks of a giant lake-dwelling Amemasu who blocked the water from flowing to the ocean. It sat here for thousands of years, and eventually, a beautiful Sika deer walked by, and the fish swallowed it whole. The deer, not appreciating this action, broke out of its gut, killing the fish in the process, and a bird who witnessed this flew off to warn the people about it. 
The big fish's corpse then flowed to the ocean, and its spirit is now responsible for tsunamis. So, a giant ghost fish that resides in both fresh and salt water. Basculegion is three meters long, that's huge! So, maybe that tail is a source of inspiration as well. And honestly, that story is just missing a dog. Then it would have all of the elements of all four of these new Pokémon. Speaking of the four Pokémon, last Pokémon time, it's Hisui and Growlithe. It's... pretty simple. Honestly, the Arcanine line is already based on Shisha, Shishi, Foo Dogs, Foo Lions, Koma Inu, they go by many names, often interchangeably these days. But to be more correct, the statue without a horn is called Shishi, and the other is Koma Inu. But most of the time, neither have horns. What's up with that? And the answer is just history. The statues that were created after the Showa era simply do not have a horn. Why? Well, as far as my research shows, during the Meiji period, again, roughly when this game takes place, shortly after Japan's war with Russia, the production of these statues grew to commemorate their victory. This sparked a boom in popularity that continued to grow and peaked in 1940. And this was the era where things were beginning to become standardized or more mass produced. And a big part of that is refining the design of things. The statue makers noted that the horns were always the first part to break, and they were tired of having to go fix them all the time. So sure enough, they just stopped giving them horns. Mass media also grew during this time, so putting a horn on one of them sort of just fell out of fashion. And so that of course means that if we are basing a Pokemon game before that happened, then yeah, of course it would have a horn, simple as. Plus, Growlithe's official description states, the sharp horn on its head is made of rock, but it breaks easily. It's just too good. And it's not like that idea is uncommon. Here's Tama from Sakuna of Rice and Ruin, and his horn is broken too. So really, Hisui and Growlithe's design pulls from the same thing that Arcanine and Growlithe already pulled from, but now it's much more literal, especially with its rock typing and style of fur more closely resembling older styles of the statues. And the bib-looking part of the mane is no accident. Some temples practice putting fresh bibs on the statues as a Shinto rite, though nobody knows for certain when or why that started. And it's more commonly done at Inari shrines on a fox statue, but either way, it's been done for centuries so the tradition stands. And of course, Komainu always come in pairs, hence their official description stating that they tend to be seen watching over their territory in pairs. Now, why didn't they show Arcanine? I have a feeling it's because it's not going to evolve into an Arcanine, it's going to evolve into a completely different Pokémon. But what sort of Pokémon would that be? Well, interestingly, it's rare, but sometimes rather than lion-like dogs, these statues would depict more wolf-like creatures. So what if, to further differentiate from Arcanine, Hisui and Growlithe evolves into a mon that's more wolf-like? Then it could also resemble the Hokkaido Wolf, also known as the Sakhalin Wolf. It lived on Hokkaido and eastern Russia, but eventually went extinct around the 1940s. Which again, would explain why we don't see this form of Growlithe in any of the more modern games. Interestingly, Seta is the Ainu word for dog and wolf. They didn't particularly recognize a difference, and would breed their dogs with wolves to get hybrids. And of course, they revered these wolves as Horkeu Kamui, or howling gods, howling spirits, for their prowess of hunting, and would often leave portions of their kills for the wolves to enjoy. And similarly, they would find wolf kills and partake in parts too. And you know how Arcanine was originally considered to be a legendary Pokémon? Heck, that's still what it's labeled as in the Pokédex. Well, what if this potential alternate evolution is a sort of legendary, as wolves play a role in the Ainu creation myth? A white wolf and a goddess worked together to create humans, after all. So that would be super cool, and would still work as an Arcanine, I suppose. What do you think? Does that thinking involve checking out Kaihatsu's channel and Twitter, linked in the description and here? He helped us out with this video, as he knows more about the Ainu than anyone else I know. He's been working on a deep dive of Pokémon Legends Arceus for a while now, and I can already tell it's going to be the most detailed one on the internet. So follow him to be notified when that comes out. And until next time, never stop using your noggin.